matching books. So um, one of the things is with, um, you know, having where, um, you know, we have three courses and two books, it, um, I think you can kind of guess that that means that uh, one class is going to use two books, and this is the one. So for the rest of the semester, we will stick with um, the Rights, Liberty, and Justice book. So um, just to let you know, is that if in the future you take Political Science 303 from either myself or Professor Hinkle, um, you can use that book again. Likewise, actually, if you take Political Science 302 from me or Professor Hinkle, you can use the uh, Rights, Liberty, and Justice book again. So, uh, you know, just to keep that in mind, um, you know, as far as, you know, book retention. You know, I know some people save their books, some people sell their books. Um, but people sell their books. So, we are now into Chapter 11 here. So, Foundations of the Right to Privacy. It's where we're going to kind of start out at. So the main case today is Griswold, but kind of to get to Griswold, we kind of have to lead up into some of the questions about um, about the right to privacy itself. So, you know, where do we get this darn right to privacy? You know, because it's not in there. So you can see that we aren't gonna to cover too many pages in the book but a lot of important concepts. So um, one of the things that um, is kind of a challenge for me teaching this now is in light of the Dobbs case, you know, how exactly do I teach it anymore? So um, I'm gonna kind of leave, I'm gonna probably, you're probably gonna hear me mention Dobbs uh, a lot before we get to it, but not kind of get into what it talks about, but get where we can, when we get to Dobbs uh, at the end of this section, um, to kind of see where things kind of go in the future, if you will, and how the court got to their decision. So the right to privacy. So, um, you know, this is something that um, if, you if you take my criminal procedure one class, um, maybe some of you have taken it, maybe some of you haven't. Um, in criminal procedure, um, the basic thing is there the Fourth Amendment. And there, we talk about reasonable expectation of privacy, that, but that's kind of my next slide. But um, the word privacy, if you pick up your little constitution, um, Justice Black, um, whenever he was on the court, he carried around all those little pocket constitutions that you get from the, uh, um, that you get from your congressman. And, you know, he would, um, he's going to come up at the end of the lecture here. Um, you know, being a textualist, what he would say is, with his thick Alabama accent, where is this in the Constitution? Would you please provide me the page? Would you please tell me or what amendment or what section or what article it would be in? So, you know, for somebody like Justice Black, if something is not enumerated in the Constitution, it's not there. So, if you were to look at the dictionary definition, the state of being free from unwanted or undue intrusion or disturbance in one's private life or affairs. Um, freedom to be let alone. So that's what the dictionary says. Now, there are certain constitutional provisions that we're going to see, and this is Justice Douglas's argument, that seem to imply that there's a right to privacy. So in the First Amendment to the Constitution, what we have is the right of association. So the right that if you want to associate with some group, you can do so. And also, if the group does not want to associate with you, they can disassociate. While this, uh, while the Third Amendment is not considered one of the most well-known ones, prohibition of quartering soldiers during peacetime. Um, that was in direct, um, direct, um, what do you call it? Um, that was a direct effect of the, of the pre-revolutionary time. The Fourth Amendment on search and seizure protections that, you know, they can't come, they can't, they can't, um, you can't get a you can't get a warrant without probable cause, and um, you know, that's that's the big one. 
So the Fifth Amendment has a protection against self-incrimination. Now, the Ninth Amendment, we're going to see a lot of argument on. Enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So this is, so basically the Ninth and Tenth Amendments um, were kind of uh, compromises. So the Ninth Amendment was put in place because the Hamiltonians, um, the Hamilton, the, the kind of the Federalist Hamiltonian perspective was, we don't think that there should be a Bill of Rights because you're going to have people that are more textualists say that if it's not enumerated in the Constitution, it's not there. So this was kind of put in there to say, well, just because we don't mention it doesn't mean that it's there. So kind of the argument um, by more textualists is that if I don't see A, B, and C, there is no D. So they're saying that just because there is A, B, and C doesn't mean there isn't a D. The 14th Amendment one that we're going to spend quite a bit of time on for the rest of the session and semester. Due process clause prohibits governmental intrusion in ways that infringe on personal liberty of the people. Now, even though he was not the author of the opinion, it was a concurring opinion in Katz versus the United States, um, kind of the keystone of Fourth Amendment uh, jurisprudence in the United States. Justice Harlan is the person that gave us the term. So Justice Stewart actually wrote the opinion, but uh, uh, Harlan talked about what, kind of for the Fourth Amendment cases, what is a reasonable expectation of privacy? So there's there's a right to seem to be um, within legal limits uh, to be left alone to do what you want to do. Um, it, what, so you kind of have to say, well, at what point can the government intervene in that? Clearly is when you're doing something illegal. But what can they make illegal? So there are certain areas, zones of privacy, that seem to be things that, um, you know, we consider very private. So, you know, kind of one of those things, um, if it's in your home. Now, clearly, if you have a meth lab in your home, that's probably, you know, Please still have to get a search warrant to come to come check it out, but you know you can't have a search. You can't have a um, um, what do you call it um, a meth lab, or you can't have you know where you're where you know you have you're cutting cocaine or something like that. You know you can't do that. Um, or things that are between a couple, um, and you know we're going to see that there's a little bit of difference. So initially they start talking about between a couple that's married or unmarried. When we get later in the semester, or not, well, actually in this chapter, you know, kind of the definition of what do we consider a couple that gets protection. So, um, you know, can, can, let's say, the government put in place something that says that you can't have, um, you cannot have sexual relations with somebody that is not your spouse. You know, technically, there, there are some states that still have those on the books. They're completely not enforced and not completely unconstitutional, but, you know, for now. Um, but, you know, you can't, you can't have something where, um, you know, when you're talking about two consenting adults, um, whatever they want to do um, seems to be protected by zones of privacy. Um, you know, one of the things is, is that whenever Robert Bork... So we talked about him earlier in the se session semester that he had, uh, whenever, you know, he had criticized Griswold considerably. And he said, um, you, you know, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee at the time, Joseph R. Biden Jr., you have heard of him lately, um, you know, had said, you know, kind of the, uh, the gist of the right to privacy is the government shouldn't be in your bedroom. Sounds like a good, uh, it was actually a very effective attack against Bork. It's one of the reasons he lost. So another question is, does a right have to be specifically enumerated to actually be considered a constitutional right? Now, the book doesn't have it in here. Later, we get a case called Glucksburg that kind of starts to try to lay that out. But um, I want you to consider, I want you to consider a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here in Griswold when we get to Dobbs. So the other thing 
that is going to be a big, 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 um, here I am singing the word big, um, part of this course, and I think any course in constitutional law, is um, one of the biggest things I would tell you is court composition matters. Because, um, you know, it can lead to some issues with, um, with whether the court has issues of legitimacy or not. But is it a problem if you get decisions where stare decisis, so respect for precedent, is not that much, where it's just that you just so happen to have some justices that were on one side of the ideological spectrum replaced by justices on the other side of the ideological spectrum. Olmstead, or the United States. Um, this is a case where the more important thing for us long term was not the majority opinion by Chief Justice Taft. It was the dissenting opinion by Justice Brandeis. So he seemed to in, introduce a new tort, or something you'd sue over, um, of invasion of privacy in a law review article that he wrote for Harvard Law Review in 1890. So as you can see at the bottom, one of the terms that, uh, that he coins, um, or at least he's given credit for coining, a man's home is his castle. So I think that would include everybody in the home now. Um, so to think about that is that, you know, if you start thinking about a castle, you know, you think back in the day about a castle, you know, a lot of them had moats. Um, you know, when you watch cartoons, some of them had alligators. Um, but, you know, the thing is, a castle was something that was supposed to be kind of impregnable. So you weren't supposed to be able to kind of quite get into the castle. It's supposed to be hard to get into the castle unless somebody invited you. So, you know, if you've ever watched the Smurfs, um, our little blue friends from Belgium. So, you know, Gargamel, you know, you had the little drawbridge. So, you know, it made it kind of hard to get over the moat to get in there with to, to visit him in Azrael. Um, you know, he was always wanting to, uh, he was always wanting to do some things with the Smurfs. Um, he didn't, he didn't like the Smurfs. They, uh, they seemed to get the better of him. So, the question was whether wiretap telephone conversations. So, as you can tell here, and, you know, this is something where you always kind of have to ask, um, you know, when you're thinking about people that are um, advocating originalism, you know, there are, there are these situations that, you know, you, the Founding Fathers could not uh, have envisioned telephones. Um, and here we're talking about telephones that were kind of primitive. You know, it's not like, uh, not like our, um, we call them smartphones and things that literally, um, you know, I would, I would always say that, I, you know, I've, I've often, whenever I talk about, um, reasonable expectation of privacy and things, and, you know, we talk about the fourth amendment, we talk about that in political science 302 as well, is that, um, I, I would wonder if we did a poll of people that had smartphones. So we're going to have to exclude people that don't have one from this question. Would you rather have someone root through everything in your house or apartment or have complete and total access to your smartphone? I think people might say the former rather than the latter today. Not that they have anything particularly that bad on their phone or anything, but you know, you just think about that. I mean, think about what's in your phone, literally your whole life. I mean, you know, you probably have your credit, you probably have credit cards, you, you know, apps, you, you have lots of pictures, but you know, you have, you have where you have chatted and texted with people, um, you know, things that you might not want other people to know. But for the four in this, Brandeis disagrees, said the framers sought to protect Americans in their beliefs, thoughts, in their emotions and sensations. For this reason, they established as against the government, the right to be let alone is the most comprehensive of rights and the right valued most by civilized men. To protect that right, every unjustifiable intrusion by the government upon the privacy of an individual, whatever employed, must be 
deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So remember, the Fourth Amendment is something that we're talking about the government kind of talking, doing in a criminal uh, investigation context. But if you look at that language that he uses, boy, that's something that could be extended to a lot of stuff. And of course, the thing is that we're going to find out um, today is at one time, contraception was illegal in places. So, you know, you just think about this, you know, you just think about, um, you know, let's say if you were to have, uh, let's say you were to go to Wegmans, um, you would not see um, a section in, in Wegmans where you had uh, condoms um, to purchase. You couldn't buy them on Amazon. You couldn't get them at CVS. You know, it would almost have to be kind of like a black market operation. Liberty, privacy. So, many early justices associated privacy with the concept of liberty. So this kind of takes us back to Lochner. So I think you're probably thinking, oh gosh, we have to go back to Lochner. Because um, I remember the way I was taught constitutional law by my constitutional law professor back at Indiana University, David Williams, is that we spent a lot of time on Lochner because there's kind of a, while Lochner gets repudiated, some of the things behind it kind of work their way in other instances. So liberty is mentioned in the Fifth Amendment. So this goes back to substantive due process, preventing governments from enacting a lot of different laws that were largely economic in nature. Um, but it also implied a right that was not mentioned specifically in the Constitution. So the right to contract, there was a contract clause, but that's not, it's a little bit different, the right to privacy. So a fundamental right not specifically mentioned. So the thing is that, um, just to let you know, is that if a right is fundamental, strict scrutiny will apply. So if it's strict scrutiny, the burden is on the government to show that there's a compelling state interest, that it was narrowly tailored to that compelling state interest, and it's the least restrictive means available. Um, rational basis, then the burden is on the person challenging it to show that um, basically that there's um, some type of improper motive, and that, or it's not reasonably related to that motive. So. The critical thing is, is that a law that burdens a fundamental right will generally be struck down. Not always, but most of the time. While under rational basis, it will generally be upheld. So that's something that we'll come back to when we get to uh, our chapters on discrimination. So going back to Lochner, there's Justice Rufus Peckham with his uh, John Bolton mustache, as you can tell there. Um, maybe that's where John Bolton came up with it. Um, I always kind of wonder, you know, is the mustache on the war axe maybe John Bolton's um, doing? I don't know. So again, the case involving the number of hours a baker could work, economic substantive due process. So the court ruled that you couldn't interfere with the rights of an employer and an employee to make a contract violates the liberty clause of the 14th Amendment. No state can deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. So the right to contract or sell labor is part of this. The court also, though, talks about um, police powers of state and local governments, that they have certain, they have certain, so this is one where, you know, you start thinking, well, hmm, I don't see anything in the Constitution about police powers of government. These are just things that we think that government should have the right to do. But one had to show a direct relationship to the means of the end, means and the ends of the law. So. The economic substantive due process claims uh, throughout many, many laws up until 1937 when you have the switch in time that saves nine, including child labor and minimum wage laws. So, again, you know, you had the switch in time that saved nine whenever, um, you know, you have Justice uh, um, Owen Roberts um, switches over on those cases on White Monday. But you also have where Justice Van de Vanner also retires that year, replaced by um, Hugo Black, I almost called him Lewis Black, Hugo Black, and, um, you know, you just didn't have, um, you, I mean, even if you had Roberts come back to that, 
um, you didn't have that. And the the very conservative justices, you know, either retired or died after that. So you so again, court composition matters. Now, a case from the great state of Nebraska, the Cornhusker state, the only state in America that has a unicameral legislature that is elected on a nonpartisan basis. Though everybody kind of knows who, which party they belong to. So, one of the, one of the, there were a lot of bad things that happened as a result of World War One. That um, if you take political science three hundred two, um, you would probably find out about if you didn't learn history. So there's a lot of, you know, there were a lot of German Americans. So it was the largest ethnic group in America. Um, at the time, some of them, some of those German Americans had been born in Germany. So a lot of folks that had came over from Europe by this time um, were still were still speaking. I mean, while they would speak English um, as well, um, you know, you would have where um, they were they were also learning kind of their in in you know German communities. Um, you know, they were also learning the um, ancestral tongue in addition to English. So, um, I mean, this was the case, um, not just with Germans. So, um, you know, for instance, in Southern Louisiana, um, you know, children were instructed in the French language. So you would see this in different places where you would see foreign language instruction. So the reason I think that this is um, bad is that um, the response to World War I was that um, America starts to draw inward and it really ramps up during the 1920s with a lot of the um, strict limits on immigration that come forward through there, 1921 and 1924. But um, it ended, you kind of had where you, you kind of had a move to, you know, um, you know we, we don't want to have these other languages taught. So it, it started to get where you just really didn't have that much foreign language instruction outside of maybe secondary schools and things. Which the reason I think, I think we still live with the legacy of that. So, you know, I would have loved to have, uh, um, you know, when I was in elementary school, start learning a foreign language because that's, you know, that's when your brain's like a sponge. You know, you know, whenever I was learning my ABCs, you know, maybe I could have also learned, um, you know, Spanish or French or something. But the law was a challenge prohibiting the instruction of German or any other foreign language to children below the eighth grade. Again, really, we live with we live with the results of this. So you know, I remember when I went to high school way back in the day. Um, you know, the only thing really we had outside of high school is that um, the the French teacher um, and I took Spanish, though I actually learned French on my own through Rosetta Stone. Um, actually, learning Ukrainian right now beautiful language, um, is that Miss Bilbury, um, because because all the campuses were right next to each other, um, she came over and used one of the English, used the English teacher's room to teach um, French to, um, to um, eighth graders if you want to sign up for it. The problem actually was, though, if you went to, if you continued in high school, by the time you got to your senior year, they only offered French one, two, three, and four. You know, you didn't have a French class to take. So, struck down the Liberty Clause, beyond the right to contract. So, beyond the right to contract, the court found something that was a little bit further. Without a doubt, it denotes not merely freedom from bodily restraint, but also the right of an individual to contract, engage in any common occupations of life, to acquire useful knowledge, to marry, establish a home and bring up children, to worship God, according to the dictates of his own conscience, and generally enjoy the privileges long recognized at common law as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. So, boy, that is, that's a big statement. I mean, they're saying that here, I mean, look what this includes. Freedom to marry, useful knowledge, bring up children, worship God. You know, I think you kind of cover that in the First Amendment. Um, kind of saying here that, uh, you know, recognize it common law. We don't have to have it written down. So things that were considered arbitrary, capricious, or unreasonable could be used to strike down a statute. 
So most of the time is economic statutes, and they were following kind of more of an ideological laissez-faire type of uh, um, ideology. But now, are we maybe moving into things that are deeply personal? Now, a lot of people charge judicial activism. Now, one of the things is, is that I think that it's unfortunate because, you know, whenever you had kind of the Warren court for a while, there was a lot of conservatives always talked about judicial activism. And it seems to, I think some people always think, oh, oh, it, it only applies to more liberal courts. Well, it applies to conservative courts either. Con conservative courts can, can be activist every bit as much as liberal courts. Um, your question is, though, with activism is, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. In that, generally, if you like what they're doing, you don't call it activism. If you don't like it, then you call it activism. So that is a younger Justice Douglas. So this case will sound familiar. So the doctrine became associated with more reactionary politics, much more with a Republican court, pre -new, an anti New Deal court, in opposition to New Deal and progressive legis and populist legislation. By the way, before that too. So it fell out of favor after 1937. The public wanted government intervention in the economy. So the right to contract under the 14th Amendment Sankras Act went away. So let's go back to what Justice Douglas, so I think it's important that this is Justice Douglas, who is going to be the author of Griswold. The day is gone when this court uses the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to strike down state laws, regulatory of business and industrial conditions, because they may be wise, improvident, or out of harmony with a particular school of thought. So this is where the court was basically saying, you know, if the government wants to get involved in the economy, regulate business, regulate a profession, we're not going to tell them no. But Poe versus Allman. So one of my least favorite justices of the 20th century is actually Felix Frankfurter. The reason I think that he's kind of an asshole is that um, he would not give Ruth Bader Ginsburg a clerkship because she was a woman for that sole reason. I mean, one of the most brilliant people that had came out of law school at that point couldn't get it because she was a woman. Very unfortunate. Um, he was also really kind of a, um, he was also really kind of a pernicious figure on the court. He almost kind of like went after, went after and tried to bring in people on, on his side. I mean, this was not a, this was not a very nice man. Um, and one of the strange things is, you know, you know, he was put on the court to be actually quite liberal, but he actually turned out to be quite conservative. So, you know, something that we sometimes see out of justices, you know, you can't always predict what they're going to do. Though the thing is, I think we're getting a little bit better at it lately. So there was a Connecticut law that went back to 1879 that prohibited the use of birth control. The use of birth control. So just think about this. If in Connecticut in 1961, if you were using a condom, you were violating a law. You know, now that's something that we, um, we tend to uh, encourage people. So a lot of colleges give them out for free for, for obvious reasons. They have, um, they have a number of uh, um, uses, let's say, or um, they have a number of things that they prevent from you know, sexually transmitted diseases to pregnancy. So it was a plurality opinion. So it was not, a, it was, it technically was five to four on the judgment. But what Frankfurter said is the statute had never really been enforced. And there he gets to really his judicial deference, um, where, which the thing is, Frank, I mean, there, there's a lot to having judicial deference to uh, judicial restraint, but you can take it way too far. So it says the property rem proper remedy was to resort to the pools, not the courts. So the court would no longer substitute its social and economic beliefs for the judgment of legislative bodies who were elected to pass laws. So this seems to strike a further dagger into substantive due process. Um, but Brennan concurs, concurs in the judgment, 
really on the ground. So he does not join what hear what um, um, Frankfurter is saying. He says, well, it's not a ripe controversy, so it's not ripe because, um, you know, somebody here was just challenging, you know, saying, eh, we need to get rid of this law. And they were like, well, nobody's ever really been prosecuted for it. So, you know, I mean, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it's a law, but, um, you know, it's, it's rarely, if ever, prosecuted. So, you know, things like maybe... You know, I'm, I'm sure some places have an infraction of spitting on the sidewalk, or or let's say if you go one mile over the one mile an hour over the speed limit, or one kilometer over the speed limit, depending on where you are. You know, not not generally, probably something that's generally enforced. You know, I mean, there there are a lot of these laws. Sometimes we call them zombie laws that are out there. Now, we're going to see that some of those zombie laws, when we get to abortion, when we get the Dobbs case after the, the, the uh, what do you call it, uh, aftermath of that, that they aren't so zombie. So, you know, I, I actually remember I was, when I was a deputy prosecutor, before I actually did that, I was um, a uh, an intern. And, um, you know, one of the things I was charged with doing is uh, um, one of my kind of bigger projects was going through all of our files and looking for ones that, you know, were just really, really old, um, you know, just very minor for one thing or another, you know, you know, like somebody was charged with public intoxication 10 years ago, never showed up. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, well, you know, let's dismiss it. So if the person, if the person gets a traffic ticket, they aren't going to get arrested and have a hold on them. So one of the things is under the interstate detainer system, if, uh, if, if let's say you get stopped and you had some type of outstanding warrant for yourself, you can't bail out. There's no bail for that. You have to wait and see what the other other side's going to do if they want if they want you or not. You have to wait until they say yes or no. So not a good uh, not a good thing. So I remember you know there was something like uh, you know you have people you know illegal taking of a squirrel or you know fishing with four poles. I'm kind of like. Really, really, um, DNR people. Do you, do you really want to, really want to bother somebody that's fishing with five fishing poles, or taking? I mean, literally, there's a, there's a lot of squirrels out there, um, or not wearing hunter orange. Um, that's actually one that probably should be enforced. Now, Justice Douglas has a far-reaching dissent where he really spells out his view of privacy, talking about how he thinks that there is a total that there should be a total incorporation of the Bill of Rights. He also talks about the rights of doctors and married couples. So, you know, I think I think by this time it's before you have the pill. Um, you know, so, so, you know, I mean, your birth control. Um, so, you know, I mean, the thing is for contraceptives, you know, you, you kind of have two major purposes. You know, prevention of sexually transmitted diseases, prevention of pregnancy. Um, when you're when you're talking about those, um, so I think this is probably a little bit before the pill. But now, Justice Black and Justice Stewart also have dissents here as well, um, but we'll see that they kind of have an interesting position when we get to Griswold. So the one from Justice Harlan kind of sticks out. So Justice Harlan was a very conservative justice. So one of his uh, um, one of the things that some of his biographies biographers have uh, dubbed him is the conservative conscience of the Warren Court. Well, he and Justice Black often, you know, you know, fought like cats and dogs. They were actually very good friends. And the thing, the thing I always think about Justice Harlan, he, he's one of those people that, um, you know, there he is. Um, it kind of looks like that book is sitting on its head, his head, but I don't think it is. I, at least I hope it's not. Um, is that he, he's one of those people that, um, you know, while you may not agree with him on a lot of things, you can respect him because he works on principle. So, you know, he doesn't work backwards from, from you know, I want this decision and this is the way that I structure my opinion to get it. So he seems to bring back substantive due process in his dissent. So... The enactment involves what, by common understanding throughout the English-speaking world, must be granted to be the most fundamental aspect of liberty, the privacy of the home, in the most basic sense. 
and it requires the statute to be subject to strict scrutiny. So he's saying liberty and privacy are linked. So with a new twist, we're adding personal liberties. So, you know, one of the things that I always think um, would be interesting to have seen, because we're going to get, I think, by the end of this lecture, kind of up to um, a little bit before Roe v. Wade. So both Justice Harlan and Black um, leave the court in 1971 and pass away that same year. Um, how would they have ruled on Roe v. Wade? I, I always think that that is because, I mean, two legal giants. I mean, so, you know, sometimes we have members of the court. I mean, they get on the court, but they're not exactly legal giants. I just, they are. I just like to see how they would have voted. So he thinks laws implying a liberty interest require strict scrutiny. So he extends what Brandeis said to things that are personal. So Harlan seemed to want to limit the right, though, to heterosexual couples later in his descent. So, you know, he said that, uh, you know, if we're talking about, uh, you know, fornication, misogynation, um, homosexuality, those are things that we can go after. But as far as married couples, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. They, so essentially what Harlan is saying is that if you are married, you have more rights than if you're not married or if you're, let's say, in a same-sex relationship. Griswold, a landmark case. So, when we get to Dobbs, I want you to start thinking about this question. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this up, uh, I think, kind of throughout this chapter. How much does Dobbs leave of Griswold? So we're going to kind of go through Griswold in a pretty detailed fashion. So some of the stuff I'm going to be kind of more reading from the actual case, and it won't be necessarily that I've copied into the lecture. So this basically is that, um, you know, you have a lot of women's groups that want to promote um, use of contraception, that want to make it more widespreadly available. So, remember the problem was that in that decision, I remember it was five to four, and um, Justice Harlan leaves the court in 1962 and it's replaced by, um, what's his name, uh, Arthur Goldberg. So, you know, you, you get, get that there. Um, so you have a little bit of change in composition of the court since then. So, you know, you get a little bit of change. So, um, so you also have Justice Whitaker leaves the court. So uh, replaced, but let me see. I'm trying to think if Whitaker was replaced by Byron White. Uh, I, they they both retired about. They both left the court about the same time and were replaced. So two very conservative justices um, replaced by Byron White, who's kind of uh, Byron White. I, I just have to say is a very interesting justice. We're going to see that um, sometimes he's conservative, sometimes he's not. So a little bit different, um, a little bit different composition of the court within a few years, but largely the same case and the same arguments. So again, this is a law from 1879. You know, whenever you hear a law is from 1879, you know, I think a lot of people automatically start going, oh, that's an old law. Well, the thing is, if they wrote a law against murder in 1879, that's probably a pretty good law. Um, but, you know, if it's something that's kind of the times have changed a little bit, maybe we might want to reconsider that a little bit. So this is one where they had standing and it was a ripe case. So Griswold here was the, so Estelle Griswold and Lee Buxton. The people that ran Planned Parenthood League of Connecticut Incorporated. So what they did is that they wanted to be prosecuted. Generally, most people don't want to be prosecuted for a crime. Um, so <laughs> 
you know, you just think about this, you know, um, you know, if you're driving, you know, if you're driving like on the 290 and you're driving 90 miles an hour, are you probably, um, you know, doing that so that you can get a ticket and then go to the Amherst or Tonawanda Town Court? I hope not. Um, I don't. I don't know why you would, um, but they were wanting this. They were wanting this because what they wanted. They wanted a case to go up to the Supreme Court because what they saw with Bill Brennan. In, in that composition of the courts, Bill Brennan was kind of like, a, you know, I want to I want to rule in favor of you, but you know, the case is not the case is not right. But you know, we we can't take up we can't take up these cases in this manner. So they open up a birth birth control clinic um, with the hopes they were hoping to get arrested. They were hoping to get prosecuted. And they were. They were arrested for distributing birth control to a married couple. Wow. You know, I mean, that's something, that's something, you know, you just have to think about um, in relationship to the Dobbs case. If you take, if you take kind of it at its logical steps, what is considered birth control? Um, these days, you know, is Plan B birth control or is it abortifacient? Um, you know, does life begin? When does life begin? It's given conception, fertilization. So you can see that's their picture whenever they see that uh, they won the case. Now the arguments for uh, Griswold and uh, Buxton here is that. This violates the 14th Amendment, the Liberty Clause and the Due Process Clause. So one of the things is, is that, um, you know, they could kind of see from the dissent in Poe versus Ullman that, you know, it seemed like the dissenters kind of had a lot of different thoughts on, you know, what was um, the reason to strike the law down. So they kind of make a number of arguments. So these are fundamental rights, meaning Connecticut does not get that much deference. So you're going to apply strict scrutiny. So if you use this as a health and moral statute, it's overbroad or arbitrary. So, you know, it, kind of what they're saying is that, uh, okay, you know, we're, we're, we're just still talking about a married couple. Um, you know, if, if we want to, let's say, um, have sexual relations as a married couple, as a married man and wife, maybe we want to maybe not have as many kids. Maybe we don't want each time that we do such, um, such a thing that, um, it could lead to, uh, us having another child. Maybe you don't want that. Now, there's other arguments on prohibiting it for unmarried couples, which we'll get to later in Eisenstadt. So the idea there is that you that uh, you want to discourage people from uh, having sex at a younger age. Um, and um, here's a strange argument that that if we prohibit it, that because somebody uh, if they're having an affair could um, could impregnate somebody and it would become a scandal in the community that they would be less likely to have an affair. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So it's an invasion of privacy. So they kind of make the penumbra argument here. A lot of different amendments. So Connecticut, it's a proper exercise of its state police powers. Similar laws have been upheld and do not foreclose all birth control options, such as the rhythm method. So, um, just, um, you know, probably tend to know that I sometimes digress in some of these lectures. Uh, you probably know that I digress if I get, if I'm in class. So it's, so it's not a, it's, it's not anything different here. Um, is that, um, before, before I went back to graduate school, get my PhD, 
where I went to mass, so I am Catholic, um, each year uh, there was this couple, um, and I think I think they finally I think they're finally done having kids. They're they're now at eleven, and you know literally I mean they at some point they were they they couldn't fit in one in one row of seats at church. Eventually they quit going there, and I think they go to some place in Louisville that has a uh, Latin mass, and. They they said that they were teaching a class on natural family planning, and the thing is, I think most people knew them. I mean, I, I know them; they're very nice people. Um, but they said, you know, we're teaching a class on natural family planning, and um, you know, literally, you know, you're sitting there with, you know, with with seven kids, and your wife's pregnant, and you know, they look like little stair steps. Um, you know, and of course, I mean. Yeah, you know, my family, my, my mom was number um, number seven out of eight. Um, so, you know, I mean, families at some point used to be a little bit bigger than they are now. Um, is the old uh, uh, Catholic joke is, is that, uh, you know, uh, three is the new eight. Uh, but um, it was kind of like, well, um, hmm. And they said, well, all of our children are planned. I'm kind of like, well, okay. Um, we'll go with that. So, um you know, they also, so, you know, the one thing is, is that, um, you know, that is not um, foolproof, let's say. So, you know, you could, you could also add other things that could make it a little bit more um, effective. So they said that there is no invasion of privacy because the proof of the offense was legally obtained without coercion of voluntary witnesses. So they were essentially saying there's no invasion of privacy because literally they stuck a sign out in front of in front of the place. So, you know, how could we invade your privacy, you know, literally if you have broadcast it out there that, you know, you know, please please prosecute me. So kind of is is the Connecticut um, argument. So, so sorry, I need to get a, a little bit of water here. Um, so one thing is is that you know probably noticed that if you've had me in class before, you know, drink a lot of water. Um, um, you know, one thing is if you talk, you you, you know you need to keep your mouth uh, lubricated and with water. Um, I like water; it's my favorite beverage. Um, so let's listen to some of the oral arguments. From the Griswold case. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, what you're touching on now leads me to ask. Uh, uh, what is the purpose of what is the purpose of this legislation in Connecticut? You, your your basic argument in your brief and so far in your oral argument is that this is well within the so-called uh, police power of the state of Connecticut. Uh, and, and what what is its purpose? Well, if Your Honor, please, I think its purpose is is uh, to increase the population of Connecticut, or, or to, or to uh, impair its decrease, or is it? What but is Your Honor, it? please, I do not hold that it is to increase the population of Connecticut. I don't think that this is a, uh, we could make this claim about What is it? What is the problem? I think it's, it's to reduce the chances of immorality, if you run it, please. And I use the words immorality here in a broad sense. That is, in one way, to uh, act as a deterrent to sexual intercourse outside of the marital relationship. Well, the trouble with that argument is that on this record, this involves only married women. That is correct, Your Honor. So I, how can you make that argument? Well, if Your Honor, please, I think that on this record that the statute is a valid exercise of police power. Well, for what purpose? And if Your Honor, please, in, uh, on this purpose, on this record, that uh, there is a distinction and there has to be a distinction between birth control and the use of contraceptives. That is to, that is to say that all contraceptives involve birth control. But in order, in order to practice so-called birth control, one does not have to use contraceptives. 
and that the state is able to take this position and take this distinction, that there are, if, the, if it be said, well, should married people be allowed to use these devices? Yeah. Would this, would this uh, not, is not the state going too far? I think the state can, an, can answer to that, that there are other methods available to married people. Well, now, they may for, not, for what purpose? Under his police power. Assuming we're dealing now with married couples. Well, if Your Honor, please, going back, uh, Connecticut, in the Nelson case, cited the Byrne case in New York, in New York. And one of the reasons cited uh, by the Connecticut court and the, and the Byrne case was that it would not be, as a matter of fact, it would not be improper for the legislature to consider the, uh, that uh, Connecticut, uh, as, a, as any state, has a right to look out for its own continuation. This is the this is the population argument. I personally am not too happy with it. But well, what what argument are you happy with? I think, if Your Honor, please, the only argument that we can honestly say is that this is a question of pure power. What well, do you, you suppose? The state power. of Connecticut could prevent marriage. I think the state of Connecticut could prevent marriage on certain people, certain groups. Yes, if Your Honor, please, uh, between idiots, say, or age and marriage. I think. Your Honor, please, that the... Uh, sir, surely you'll agree with me they couldn't... Uh, I should think you'd agree with me that the state of Connecticut should say there'll be no marriages contracted in this state. There'll be no sexual intercourse of any kind, married or unmarried. I agree with you. Well, now, what purpose, what is the police power purpose of Connecticut in telling married people, two people who are married to each other, that they cannot use contraceptives? Well, I think, if Your Honor, please, it's to, to preserve... Uh, what kind of morality? What, 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 what moral purpose is Well, if Your Honor, please, it is not uh, unheard of that the use of contraceptives themselves would be immoral. Certainly, this is a view that uh, has been prevalent in history right up to the last few years in most groups. In Connecticut, I'm uh, citing the brief of, of our opponents in, in one instance of the number of... Uh, Catholics and, and Orthodox Jews in the state. If you're just to put it on a on a numerical basis, I well, think you'd have quite a different case if the if the state of Connecticut compelled their lawyer, all married couples to use them. That's not the, that's when he'd run into the, into the argument you're now making that this is uh, this uh, violates the religious precepts and beliefs of certain groups. This is this is true. But if you're on a place at all, it would be more, more difficult for the state to control the result of what you might call dissolute action. That is, fornication and adultery. That's what it's there. Well, I, that thought by, I thought you and I had agreed that, though, that that isn't involved here. We're dealing here with, the, by definition, and on this record, with advice and the furnishing of, uh, of uh, devices to, to married women who ask for such advice. Well, Your Honor, please, I think what we have here, uh, that is true. We have here a center being being used, and the witnesses that the state used in this case were, in fact, three married women. Mr. Clark, uh, inquiry, on page 15 of your brief, I don't know that I agree, but if you might provide an answer by reading what your court said in State versus Nelson. Doesn't sound like a very lofty attribution to married people, but that's the reason your court assigned. Page 15, State versus Nelson. You look at the next to the last paragraph. Your Honor, please, that's that's what I was trying to get out. I must say well, that I did, I did that rather poorly. That, that is the reason your state, I take it, assigns that morals are involved. That is correct, if Your Honor, please. The the, uh, the court held in Nelson, uh, it, meaning the legislature, was not precluded from considering that not all married people were immune from temptations or inclinations to extramarital indulgence. And... Uh, I think, if Your Honor, is that that is the moral ground then upon which presumably your court has sustained this legislation under the police power. I think so, think it is. I think that's, that's the ground on which you're relying. That is correct. So, if you just, <laughs> um, I kind of feel sorry for the um, uh, attorney there representing Connecticut. So, kind of one of the things that they were trying to argue is that. Uh, you know, let's say, you know, let's say we're talking about condoms here. Um, if you let married couples have them, um, the husband, um, the husband or maybe the wife, if they're going to have an extramarital affair with somebody else, they will use those so that uh, 
the person doesn't get pregnant. Uh, I think that's kind of what where they're at. So, um, this is a you you see here that there are multiple opinions. Now, the Douglas opinion formally has five votes. One of the things that I think make this opinion vulnerable in the long term is that even though the Goldberg opinion is a concurring opinion, it's not concurring in judgment, it's concurring with Douglas, um, you know, the, the Douglas opinion is joined um, um, fully by Clark, is that it seems like that the seven votes kind of split four ways. Um, that the five votes split two ways. The law struck down. So the key of the justice, the, the Douglas opinion, is something that we learn as the penumbra. The penumbra of rights. So what this means is, is that there are peripheral rights coming from certain rights. So, if you start looking at the elements of the first, third, fourth, fifth, and ninth amendments, they seem to be about privacy. So, Douglas, um, you know, protection, zones of privacy, protections against governmental intrusion. Um, one of the things that Justice Douglas goes out of his way of doing is something that is really more the ninth amendment argument that Goldberg makes is that there are a lot of rights that are not mentioned specifically in the Constitution. The way he kind of gets at it that is a little bit different than Goldberg, who more focuses on the Ninth Amendment, is that Douglas focuses on, you know, saying that um, these other amendments kind of imply a right to privacy. So, you know, he mentions a lot of things. So Society of Sisters, um, the Pierce case, something you'd learn in Political Science 302. The right to educate one's children as they want to do. So that was the case where it was basically trying to punish Catholic schools. Meyer, the dignity and right to study the German language in a private school. Remember, this wasn't even a public school. So, you know, other things, so that's kind of where he gets the penumbra. So, you know, he, if you notice, he starts going through the specific amendments to say kind of what we get. You know, quoting Boyd versus the United States. Per the Fourth and Fifth Amendment, a protection against all governmental invasions of the sanctity of a man's home and privacies of life. Again, man, you know, have to remember it's 1965. That would apply to everybody, though. So, We've had many controversies over these penumbra rights of privacy and repose. These cases bear witness that the right of privacy, which presses for recognition, is a legitimate one. So again, kind of talking about the zones of privacy. So prohibiting the use of contraceptions, contraceptives, not, not just not the manufacture, the use of them. So literally, you know, I mean, I think what Justice Douglas is kind of getting at is if if a man and a woman are having sex and the man is wearing a condom, they have violated the law. They have violated the law. Just think about that in today's age. Think about that if, you know, if you extend the language of the Dobbs. Okay, so especially the Thomas Concurrence. Now we want to make where Mississippi can go back to if two people have sex with a condom, they are violating the law. Now, prosecuting would be a different um, um, you know, way of putting it, but... Uh, So, such a law cannot stand in light of the familiar principle so often applied 
by this court that governmental purpose to control and prevent activities constitutionally subject to state regulations may not be achieved by means which sweep unnecessarily broadly and therefore invade the area of protective freedoms. We would allow the police to search sacred precincts of the marital bedrooms for telltale signs of use of contraceptives. The very idea is repulsive to the notions of privacy surrounding the marital relationship. Now, again, remember, we're only talking about married couples. So, um, you know, if you're not married, um, kind of under this opinion, um, though it's later going to be extended and we see an Eisenstadt, um, that you're not covered. So there, there are also laws that some states have that are so-called zombie laws that literally make it illegal for people that are not married to have sexual relations with each other. Um, you know, I mean, that's one of those things where, you know, you just start thinking, well, if you start letting them enforce that, um, you're going to be prosecuting a large chunk of American society. Um, you know, I mean, if, if, if people want to only, uh, you know, wait for marriage, you know, I mean, that's, um, that's clearly their, their, their right to do so. But, um, you know, I'll just put it like this. It's a, it's probably an increasingly small share of society. So kind of concluding here, we deal with a, with a right to privacy older than the Bill of Rights, older than our political parties, older than our school system. Marriage is a coming together for better or worse. Douglas is married four times, I think. So yeah, I think he probably knows that. Uh, hopefully enduring and intimate to the degree of being sacred. It is an association that promotes a way of life, not causes, harmony and living, not political face, bilateral loyalty, not commercial or social projects. Yet it is an association as noble as a purpose as any of our prior decisions. So, so one of the things about Justice Douglas is that he did not rely on his clerks that much. Um, he would often write these decisions, sometimes um, because he would fly to New York um, after, after decisions were um, uh, put out. He would sometimes write these decisions on the airplane. Um, so, you know, he is the most prolific author. He authored more Supreme Court decisions than any other justice in American history. That also is the fact that he was the longest serving justice on the court, and the court uh, used to work a lot more than it used to. It doesn't work that much compared to what it does now, to be frank, be honest. Justice Arthur Goldberg. Justice Arthur Goldberg um, is the person that probably should have been the Chief Justice instead of Warren Berger. So those of you that have uh, either taken or will take me for Political Science 305 probably know what I'm talking about. So Johnson tries to get him off the court to create a vacancy to put Abe Fortas on the court. Um, the thing is, um, whenever, Warren, whenever Earl Warren retires, Goldberg would have been confirmed with probably unanimous vote. But he doesn't do that. So he's joined by Justice Chief Justice Warren and Justice Brennan. So you're probably thinking there, if you know much about the justices, that, boy, those are two pretty liberal justices. So Tom Clark, not exactly known as the most liberal justice in the history of the court. Again, one of the interesting things, too, about Lyndon Johnson is that it's Lyndon Johnson. He appoints Tom Clark's son to be attorney general to create a vacancy. I'm sorry, not attorney general, but solicitor general, so that he can name Thurgood Marshall the court. So LBJ, kind of tricky guy. So one of the big things about Justice Goldberg, so remember, he fully joins in the Douglas opinion. So I think that one of the things that would have been kind of interesting is if you could have gotten all of them on board for just one opinion. So clearly one of the things about Douglas is that he wanted um, to put out his views about incorporation, about the penumbra. But, but clearly the thing is, is that Chief Justice Warren in the majority was the one that assigned the opinion. He assigned it to Douglas. 
um, which is kind of interesting. But uh, but what he really focuses on is the Ninth Amendment. So the Ninth Amendment again says. And the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights by the people. So this was kind of what Hamilton wanted in exchange for having the Bill of Rights. Again, a lot of the Federalists and supporters of the Constitution were concerned if you put a Bill of Rights in there that some people are going to say that if it's not written in the Bill of Rights, you don't have it. So, I mean, one of the things is, though, kind of the thing about the Ninth Amendment. So, um, you know, Goldberg kind of uh, looks at some of the constitutional debates about that. So, you know, one of the things clearly he acknowledges is, while this court has had little occasion to interpret the Ninth Amendment, it cannot be presumed that any clause in the Constitution is to be intended without effect. So this is one of the things that I think he is uh, trying to respond to, I think, Justice Black, um, who says, you know, we've had a long time to consider the Ninth Amendment. We don't have any cases on it. So, but since 1791, it has been a basic part of the Constitution we are sworn to uphold. So he's saying, you know, it's not like it's, it's not like it's invisible. Uh, to hold that a basic and fundamental and so deeply rooted in our society as the right to privacy in marriage shall be infringed because that right is not guaranteed in so many words by the first eight amendments in the Constitution is to ignore the Ninth Amendment and give it no effect whatsoever. Moreover, judicial construction that this fundamental right is not protected by the Constitution is because because it is not mentioned in explicit terms is one by one of the first eight amendments or nowhere else in the Constitution would violate the Ninth Amendment, which specifically states that enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So with construed, um, Justice Goldberg adds emphasis. So he kind of also looks to kind of the history of the Ninth Amendment, um, kind of seeing that um, that in some the Ninth Amendment simply lends strong support to the view that the liberty protected by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments from infringement by the federal government or states is not restricted to rights specifically mentioned in the First Eighth Amendment. So I think he, I think where he's trying to do there is trying to give up maybe a little bit of a bone. To Justice Harlan and Justice White, who only concur. So here what he does is to try to um, join a little bit of Justice Douglas um, from Poe versus Ullman. In determining which rights are fundamental, judges are not left at large to decide cases in the light of their personal and private notions. Rather, they must look to the traditions and collective conscience of our people to determine whether it is a principle so rooted to be ranked as fundamental. The inquiry is whether a right is involved in such a nature that it cannot be denied without violating these fundamental principles of liberty and justice which lie at the base of our civil and political institution. Liberty also gains this content from the emanations of specific constitutional guarantees and from the experience of requirements of a free society. So where is that maybe going to kind of come up again? Glucksburg. Glucksburg. I really, one of the things I'm always disappointed about this book is that they do not put Glucksburg versus Washington, where, which is kind of um, where the court kind of draws a lot of more recent jurisprudence from his case in 1997. We'll kind of hit on it a little bit. I'll try to expand on it a little bit more. Things that are more deeply rooted. So we have two justices, however, they concur in the judgment, but they cannot, they cannot get on board with Goldberg or Douglas. So the first is Justice Harlan. So he agrees with the outcome, but not the reasoning. He says this is simply a 14th Amendment due process liberty clause violation. 
And he says, don't look at the other amendments. All you have to do is look at the 14th Amendment. So, you know, he says, you know, I explained it length in Poe versus Allman. I believe, you know, the relevant inquiry may be aided by resort to one of the more, um, um, one or more provisions of the Bill of Rights, but it is not dependent on them for, radi for its radiations. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment stands, in my opinion, as his own bottom opinion. So, basically, Harlan is saying, you know, you know, don't focus on, you know, forget about the Ninth Amendment, um, you know, forget about these others. You know, they may be helpful, but they aren't the be-all and end-all. Now, Justice White, Justice White is going to come up kind of interestingly enough when we get to Roe v. Wade in the next lecture. Because he is the center of Roe v. Wade, he also sees that there's a 14th Amendment violation. In my view, this Connecticut law is applied to married couples, deprives them of the liberty without due process of law, as which is the concept of the 14th Amendment. So, when there is a significant encroachment on personal liberty, government may only prevail if there's a compelling interest. He says that the court does. So, Justice White has a little bit of a problem in kind of where they're going here. So, you know, he quotes Pierce. Um, you know, saying that, um, talking about basic rights of man. Um, and, you know, he also, he also kind of gets to, um, the marital relationship here. But I think he doesn't want to go too far because, um, rather the statute is said to serve the state's policy against all forms of promiscuous or illicit sexual relationships, whether they be premarital, extramarital, uh, preceding a, permissible and legitimate state goal. So, he seems to be saying that, uh, you know, uh, maybe some of the reasons behind the Connecticut law might be, might be okay. But it's with married couples. So, um, you know, I mean, I think he seems to say that, um, you know, why are you applying this to married couples? Connecticut does not bar the importation or possession of contraceptive devices. They are not considered contraband material under state law, and their avail availability in the state is not seriously disputed. The only way Connecticut seeks to limit or control the availability of such devices is through general aiding and abetting statute, and whose operation in this context has been quite obviously ineffective and whose serious use has been against birth control clinics, rendering advice to the married rather than unmarried persons. Indeed, over 80 years of the state's prescription of use, the legality of such devices to prevent disease has never been passed upon, although it appears that the sales have long occurred and only infrequently been challenged. So one of the things that you see that Justice White is saying that, uh, you know, use of uh, certain contraceptive uh, devices also have some health purposes. Namely, that, um, you know, maybe we don't want to um, spread sexually, sexually transmissible diseases around. So, it's kind of an interesting um, two that are in dissent. So, um, one of the things that you may remember from that clip that we saw is that Justice Stewart was absolutely, you know, grilling the attorney for Connecticut. So, this is one of the reasons that you cannot always say that a, um, that a, an oral argument will tell you where the justices are going. And usually they do, but not always. So remember, Justice Black is a textualist. If I had it here, I would do it. If I had you in person, I would pull out my little constitution out of my pocket, um, very nicely provided from Congressman Higgins' office, um, and say, you know, where is this? Where is it? So what Justice Black says is, you have to read individual amendments individually. There is no right to privacy found in the Constitution. He doesn't buy the Ninth Amendment arguments. So, 
so he kind of brings this up. So this is where Justice Goldberg, you had seen, was trying to um, kind of re reply to it, you know, is that why is it that, you know, the Constitution was ratified in 1789 and now it's and now we're in the 1960s? Where are the darn cases? Where have people brought this up um, as far as, um, you know, where we have that? So by this time also that Justice Black is also kind of, uh, you know, because he's from Alabama, he's kind of reverting a little bit back to some states' rights and things. You know, saying, while our court has constitutional power to strike down statutes, state or federal, that violate the commands of our federal constitution, I do not believe that we were granted power by the due process clause or any other constitutional provision or provisions to measure constitutionally our belief that a legislation is arbitrary, capricious, unreasonable, or accomplishes no justifiable purpose, or is offensive to our own notion of civilized standards of conduct. So basically what Justice Black is saying is that the way that you get to this is if the legislature has passed something that's really bad, have the legislature repeal it. Have the legislature repeal it. So, you know, you know, I, I think one of the interesting things, our court has certainly has no ma uh, machinery to take of which to take a gallop poll. So kind of uh, trying to uh, kind of hit at some of the um, other arguments that, that you know, um, that, that were responding to public opinion here. So, of course, the other thing is when you're talking about public opinion, if you're talking about within a state and uh, public opinion, you know, you would hope that, um, you know, I think Justice Black would kind of come back on you is that to say, well, if it's so unpopular within the state of Connecticut, why doesn't the Connecticut legislature and the governor repeal it? If any broad unlimited power to hold laws unconstitutional because they offend what this court um, conceives to be the collective power of the conscience of the people is vested in this court by the Ninth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, or any provision of the Constitution. Is it was not given by the framers, but rather bestowed on the court by the court. The fact is perhaps responsible for the peculiar phenomenon that for a period of a century and a half, no serious suggestion was ever made that the Ninth Amendment enacted to protect state powers against federal invasion could be used as a weapon of the federal government to prevent state legislatures from passing laws that they consider appropriate to govern local affairs. Use of any broad, unbounded judicial authority would make this court members a day-to-day -day constitutional convention. So Justice Black, kind of, I think, is coming back on Justice, Doug, Justice Goldberg in saying that um, what you say is the purpose of the Ninth Amendment was more of a state power not a federal power. So, I realize that many good and able men have eloquently spoken and written, sometimes in perhaps a deistical status, about the duty of this court to keep the Constitution in tune with its times. So the idea that the Constitution must be changed from time to time is an idea that this court is charged with the duty of making charge changes. For myself, I believe with all deference and reject this philosophy, the constitutional makers knew that the need for, for change and approved of it. So I'm um, not going to read any more. Um, basically what Justice Black said is, is that they created an ability to change the Constitution. So you get two thirds of Cong both chambers of Congress and three fourths of the state legislatures to do this. So what Justice Black is saying is that you're basically asking us here as a court to change the constitution by judicial fiat. I'm not gonna do this. Now, Justice Stewart's dissent, I think is very interesting because one of the things that we're gonna find when we get to the next lecture is that Justice Stewart is going to be, in his time on the court, one of the biggest champions of abortion rights. He's joined by Justice Black. He says that this is a silly law. He says, you know, this is not a good law. Uh, but remember, remember how he was grilling the attorney that was representing the state of Connecticut in that clip. 
So, what provision of the Constitution does make this state law invalid? The court says that its right to privacy was created by several fundamental constitutional guarantees. With all deference, I can find no general right of privacy in the, con in the Bill of Rights, in any part of the Constitution, or in any case decided by this court. So I think he's kind of looking at it at the time, as, kind of like Justice Black, is saying that the Ninth and Tenth Amendments really were more states' rights provisions. So, um, but we are not asked in this case to, dis to say whether we think that this law is unwise or even asinine. We are asked to see if this violates the Constitution, and I don't think that it is. He doesn't see if there's a right to privacy. Though the thing is, it seems like he's later going to be brought on board a little bit later. So, let's kind of preview a little bit um, before Roe. So we'll see how much we'll get through this today. Um, what, what, just to let you know, one thing is, is, that, is that I think that probably most of you can tell that this is a fairly new lecture because I'm talking about Dobbs all the time, um, is that, um, you know, given that case, I've kind of had to fundamentally start figuring out how I teach this class, um, which is kind of a... Which is kind of a, uh, you know, when, when you've taught a class several times, you know, you kind of have to start thinking about, um, well, um, you know, how the heck do I do it if I have to kind of fundamentally restructure it? So that's kind of how you're going to see this in uh, recorded time. So before Roe v. Wade, few states allowed abortions to be um, performed. The majority did not even allow exceptions for rape and incest, uh, life of the mother, or deformity, or even sometimes health of the mother. So life of the mother, sometimes a little bit different than health of the mother. Um, so we'll talk about this a little bit later. So it was a crime to perform and obtain an abortion. Um, a lot of abortions were illegal abortions or self-induced. Um, though the one thing is, uh, a lot of these things were not often um, enforced. So, um, New York, um, 1971, we're going to see a clip here, um, towards the end of the lecture, um, one of the first states to, um, largely legalize abortion, though California sort of did because there was, there was, there was such a big exception that, uh, in a, in a bill that Ronald Reagan, um, signed that I think literally you could probably, uh, drive a truck through. So because of the decision in Griswold, and because of the composition of the court, there were groups that were in favor of giving women the right to decide if they wanted to have an abortion to make that a Supreme Court case, to get a case eventually up to the Supreme Court. So, you know, it's it's not the quickest way to get a, you know, you, you can't get a case immediately up to the Supreme Court, but you can work your way up there. So the thinking was with the decision in Griswold, boy, maybe we could get the court to rule that abortion is a fundamental right. Because, you just think about it, the decision whether you want to have kids or not, if you're pregnant, if you're a woman, boy, that's pretty private. It's pretty fundamental. So, one of the things is that when you had abortion that was illegal, you still had abortion. I mean, it's one of those things where I think that, you know, in a lot of Dobbs, where we're seeing a lot of states um, make abortion illegal, you know, people can go to other states, uh, you know, people go to Canada, um, you know, some people, you know, I think there's the interesting story of Congressman Barbara Lee, um, Congressman from Oakland, who, who gives the story about, um, I might try to add, um, see if I can find this clip a little bit in the next lecture, um, you know, she went to Tijuana because abortion at the time, this is before Ronald Reagan kind of liberalized abortion laws in the state, um, she went to Tijuana to get an illegal abortion. So, kind of the thing that you have to kind of keep in mind is that women of means are going to be able to obtain a safe and legal abor safe abortion. Poorer women are going to have a harder time. So, just think about this before Rome. You look at the states that are kind of in that bluish green. Those were states that allowed um, abortion rights. 
states that are in kind of the grayish color, they had abortion with exceptions for rape and incest. Health of the mother sometimes. The others, it was basically just completely illegal. So again, if you were if you if you were a person of means, you had no problem getting an abortion. It might be a little bit of an inconvenience, but you get one. Now, there were cases that were kind of matriculating, working their way up. But remember, we're kind of going into the Burger Court era. So, you know, you have the American Civil Liberties Union, NARAL originally, which was the National Association for Abortion Repeal. Um, it later becomes the National Abortion Rights League. Um, I think it's actually changed its name again. Um, uh, now it's NARAL Pro-Choice America. They were trying to get states to change their abortion laws. They were not having that much uh, effect. But what was happening was, is that they thought even with even with Warren Berger and Harry Blackman, that you still had a pretty favorable court. So the idea was that in a, the right to an abortion was fundamental. So some of these were on behalf of women, some were on behalf of doctors, some were on behalf of both, challenging lots of different type of abortion laws. So challenging ones on rape and incest, challenging, challenging all types of abortion laws. So um, we're going to talk about some of the procedural history later, but you know what we saw in 1971 is kind of one of the first um, attacks. So a challenge to an abortion law in Washington D.C. that banned abortion except for the um, necessary for the life of the health of the mother. So the challenge was whether health was unconstitutionally vague by the doctor. So the court had two questions. Um, did they have jurisdiction and whether the term was vague? So as to part one, it's five four decision by Black, they said they did have jurisdiction. Part two, they said um, that um, it was not unconstitutionally vague. So, so shortly after that case was decided, the court granted cert in Roe v. Wade and Doe versus Bolton. So one case from Texas and one case from Georgia. So um, let's take a look here about the debate about abortion before Roe. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. Today, we Today we find it the center of a gathering storm as women and men argue the question of abortion, the right to life, or the woman's right to choose. It's a highly charged issue and a political one as well. In the last 10 days, the President of the United States has rejected recommendations made by his own appointed Commission on Population Growth that urged liberalized abortion laws. And then the President injected himself into the controversy with a letter to Cardinal Cook, head of the Catholic Archdiocese of New York, supporting the Church's fight against liberal abortion laws. Walkley. This week, the New York State Legislature voted to repeal the two-year-old law that had given New York State the most liberal abortion policy in the country, permitting abortion on demand within the first 24 weeks of pregnancy. Governor Nelson Rockefeller vetoed this repeal bill. But the fight continues across the country. Both sides press their propaganda war with rallies and marches, slogans and posters. The laws on abortion vary from state to state. Three states, Washington, Alaska, and Hawaii, have abortion laws somewhat similar to New York's, but with residency requirements. Thirteen states have laws permitting legal abortion in certain circumstances. All the rest prohibit abortion except to save the life of the pregnant woman. Each demonstration, each parade, be it in Atlanta or New York City or wherever, attracts opposing pickets. The result, a melange of slogans and statements. Heated debate on abortion is taking place throughout the country. You can hear it in churches, women's clubs, on college campuses and state legislatures. One lawmaker brought a fetus in a bottle to the New York debate. Here's your victim, Mr. Blumenthal. Right here. In the jar. Unobserved by the majority of members of this house because many of them haven't got the courage to that decision is personal, not only for the people of the state of New York, but for each and every member of this legislature. 
And I'm not going to have 149 members of this legislature tell my wife what her decision should be in case she desires an abortion. I don't know how to measure the beginning of life except at the point of conception. For me, there is no other benchmark place the hospital being a place where you go to preserve life, to cure illness. We have the shameful situation where a part of that facility, which is dedicated to the preservation of life, is used to deliberately kill. There should be no man, no priest or politician, no doctor or any hospital administrator, no government official or husband who should have the right to force any woman to have a child against her will. I think that the time is here now that we as women must fight the established restrictions that exist on a woman's right to control her own reproductive processes and that this is a right that no state should be allowed to abridge i don't feel it's ever been proven that the child that the 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 fetus within the womb is not human i've heard a lot of arguments and i still haven't heard that it is not human the decisive battles over the question of abortion are taking place in the legislatures and in the courts, where the old and the new laws written in the legislatures are being challenged. The Supreme Court has been asked to rule specifically whether laws restricting abortion in Texas and Georgia are a violation of the right to privacy and a denial of individual rights guaranteed by the Constitution. If the Supreme Court decides that Texas and Georgia laws on abortion are unconstitutional, that would open the way to legalized abortion throughout the country. But if the Supreme Court decides that a woman's constitutional rights are not breached by anti-abortion laws, well, then it seems likely the opposing forces will continue to do battle for many Mother's Days to come. So I, I actually thought that I might get to Eisenstadt versus Baird, but uh, I'm kind of uh, um, hitting, hitting usually kind of my... Uh, um, uh, maximum time on the recorded lectures, but I want you to kind of take um, as our closing here what that was Chris Wall. That was uh, um, Chris Wallace's father. There, if you if you notice him, he was was at Fox News, host of Fox News Sunday, and host of pro several presidential debates now at CNN. Um, what, what he said there, which is kind of the case now, is that if the court does not hold this as a fundamental right, it's going to be decided state by state. It's kind of where we went back to now. So there is the court that is going to decide Roe v. Wade. So um, one of the things that I would just tell you is that this case is going to have some interesting um, the way it gets there, including the resignation and later passing away of a couple of justices. So, until then, uh, Fran, just, uh, uh, I'm pretty good here. Um, y'all aren't going anywhere. Um, so we'll get to that next time. So I hope everyone is having a nice day, and uh, I will see you all later. Bye-bye.